The Tao, the way of righteousness, the natural order of the world, uncreated and eternal, it is the source of reality, the greater whole from which all the individual elements derive. The Tao drives the flow of the universe, but without essential purpose, only transforming everything. The only constant is change. Chinese cosmology teaches that the universe was created from primordial chaos, from which all material energy organized itself, giving rise to Tai Chi. The elemental oneness whence the duality of yin and yang originates. This dualism describes how seemingly opposing forces may be complementary to each other, forming a whole that is greater than the assembled parts. Yin and yang are also interdependent. One cannot exist without the other, as day turns into night and winter into summer. Taoism sees in the cyclic motion the pattern of reality, the order inside the constant change that is the flow of the Tao. The symbol that represents this set of ideas is the Tai Jitu, usually known in the West as the yin and yang symbol, or simply the Taoist symbol. In the cosmology pertaining to yang and yin, the material energy from which the world has created itself out is referred to as qi. The ancient Chinese described qi as a life force that permeates everything and links the flow of energy around and through the body. Some Chinese thinkers even believed that there were different fractions of qi, the heaviest form solids, the lighter form liquids and the most ethereal fractions were the life breath that animated living beings. It's easy now to match the Tao with the Creator, as both are the original forces that preceded and gave birth to the universe, but not interfering directly in its development, only by giving it an order, such as the forces of yin and yang, or the will of time, both of which set the pattern of reality pervading all objects and lives, both taking its energy from a unique source, Qi and the One Power, respectively. These two are alike, as they both are divided into five elements, some heavier and some lighter, and even one representing the spirit. The most compelling fact is that both have a division between male and female parts, Yin and Yang, Saidar and Saidin. Needless to say, the Tai Chi is the source of influence for the old symbol of the Aes Sedai, used in the times when both male and female Aes Sedai worked together, combining Saidin and Saidar to make greater achievements. Although they don't match completely, have in mind that, over the centuries, the Tai Chi adopted many forms and, in ancient times, it had its colors reversed, matching what in Ron's time is the Dragon Fang, symbolizing Saidin and the male half of the One Power, and the Flame of Tarvalon, representing Saidar and the female Aes Sedai power of Tarvalon. In the last book, we discovered there's a mysterious land further east, Shara, where only a few merchants go, pursuing the trade of silk. That's enough to draw a parallel with China and the Silk Road, but Chinese influences on Wheel of Time are countless. For instance, the Divine Incantation Scripture, the oldest Taoist text that details an apocalypse, introduces Li Hong, a messianic figure prophesied to appear at the end of the world cycle to set right heaven and earth at a time of upheaval and chaos. He is sometimes considered to be a reincarnation of Lao Tzu, one of the founders of Taoism. Prophecies concerning Li Hong's appearance have been used to legitimize numerous rebellions and insurgencies, particularly between the 5th and 10th centuries, all of which rallied around Li Hong, evidence enough to equate it to the dragon reborn and the false dragons that from time to time arise. The opening pages of the Fires of Heaven begin at Tarvalon, in the shoes of Elaira, who's not having an easy time at Summerlin. Her Aes Sedai sisters don't see nor treat her like a true leader, and she's resentful of that. It is implied she's possibly allied with Pat and Fane. I wonder what else could this guy give to the series. Fleeing from the island city, the group composed of Min, Swan, Liani and Loghain are searching for the place the Blue Eyes has settled after breaking with the tower, and are being followed by Gareth Bryne the former leader of the royal guard of Andor, for burning a barn in Brian's town. The prologue ends with a scene showing how the forsaken Rabin 
is ruling in Gengling, with Queen Morgay's Vander under his spell. Rand is still in Roydian, where the forsaken Asmodian keeps teaching him in the use of the One Power, hidden under the identity of the Gleeman Jason Natale. Six of the Aeol clans have accepted Rand as Karakarn already, five others haven't yet, and the last one, the Shadow, is utterly opposed to Rand, as its leader, Kuladin, claims to be the true chief of chiefs, and plans to make war on Rand. Many Aeolmen from every clan have gone mad, throwing their spears and running away since Rand revealed their true origins. All the while, Luther and Telamon's memories keep leaking into him, adding to Rand's strain. His relation with Avienda, meanwhile, keeps progressing and, as we'll see, it's getting ripe. At one point, Roydian is attacked by Shadowspawn, but Rand manages to kill the dangerous creatures with Balefire. Moraine explains this weapon erases the target's threat on the pattern of reality in such a way that it ceases to exist, along with its past actions, as far back in time as the Balefire Bolt was strong. This is unnecessary to me, more so considering that Rand learns to use it out of nowhere. Matt is saved by this and healed by Moraine, but only after he takes out his foxhead medallion, the one he got from the creatures of the Redstone Dwarframe. Thus, we learn that medallion stops the One Power from being used on him. The latter, at least, found some relief as he started some kind of relationship with Melindra, another maiden of the spear, although it may not all be as it seems. Rand, by some means, is now able to create gateways to teleport himself wherever he chooses. This also comes out of nowhere. The art of creating those gateways was forgotten many centuries ago, and now he learned it like nothing. Not even Moraine is able to create them, even though she can cast Bale of Fire. I hope it won't be long for the explanation to these things. Traveling this way, Rand checks on the little statue figurines he safely stole in his room, and just in that moment Lanfear appears, tempting him to use them, in her words, to get a power enough to put him above the Creator and the Dark One both. He rejects her and decides to move his six clans to the west, following Quiladin and the Shido, who are marching to the other side of the spine of the world, followed by other five clans, although it is unknown whether these five are allied to Kuladin or not. Simultaneously, Nynaeve, Elaine and Tom are fleeing the Black Aja and Mogirian after their fight in Tanchico at the end of the Shadow Rising. Initially the goal is to travel to Tarvalon to give news of their success, but a series of events during the trip ends up changing their plans. The first happening is at the town of Mardesin, in the border between Taravon and Amadisha. Nynaeve spots a sign of a yellow Aja hidden message and tries to get in touch with the messenger, but it turns out to be a trap and she and Elaine get drugged and tied as the supposed yellow Aja spy was working for Elida with orders of grabbing Elaine and sending her to the tower. After being rescued by Tom and Joylin, a thief captured the trouble with them, the girls decide to dye their hair and disguise as a lady and her maid. Nynaeve resents playing the role as Elaine's maid, even though Elaine points out that it is logical that she plays the lady given that she truly is one, but in a way, during this whole book, Nynaeve behaves more insufferable, stubborn and misandrist than ever. That's why I was particularly glad when Nynaeve met Egwene in Teleiron Riyadh and was guided by her, setting from the known the relationship between them, with Egwene in control, as if Nynaeve was younger. What can I say, she had it coming. During that encounter in the dream world, they learn Elida is now in control of the White Tower, and Egwene lets Moraine know. Later on, in the town of Sienda, Inside the Madisha, the children of the Light Nation, they are found by Galad, who is now a White Cloak. He tries to convince them to go to Camelin, to be safe from Aes Sedai, whom he despises. They buy time, and as soon as they can, they flee Sienda, and join a menagerie, encamped nearly. For most of the book, they will travel working as performers of the menagerie, while being hunted by Mogidian, as it is revealed that the Forsaken is looking for Nynaeve, seeking revenge for her defeat in the last book. Meanwhile, we learn that Morghese is trying to escape Raven's control in Camelin, and, as she cannot get rid of him, she decides to flee the city and try to regain her power from outside. Rand leads the Aeol through the mountain passes, crossing the spine of the world into the west. All through this journey, Moraine keeps very close to him, trying to teach him as much as she can, and strangely, acting somewhat submissive to him. On their way, they keep finding the remains of the slaughter and destruction Kuladin left with his Shadow clan, killing everyone on their path. At one point, 
Some rioters from Kyrian arrive and inform Rand that Kuladin's men are besieging the city. Quickly, Rand decides to go after him, to stop him. One night, on the way to Kyrian, Rand enters his room and walks on a vienda naked, washing herself. Deeply embarrassed, she turns, materializing a gateway and running away through it. Rand follows her with her clothes in a bundle, to prevent her from freezing as they appear to be on a frozen plain at the other side of the world on the Shanshan continent, with a heavy snow blizzard falling. In her panic, a vienda breaks through the ice of a frozen lake, and Rand rescues her from freezing to death. After that, he finds shelter for both of them. When Avienda wakes up, she says she tried to run away from what she saw in her vision in Roydian, when she was tested to become a wise one. But the vision does not lie, and she will run no more. Rand and Avienda kiss, and then, well... SEX! What's funny is that, in the end, rather than being the third woman, Avienda ended up being the first one, if you know what I mean. This scene was better than I imagined for the first time, but I'm tired of kids suddenly knowing how to open gateways and stuff with no explanation whatsoever. That's why I would hate it if the claim from Elaine that she's able to create a Terangriel ends up being true. Min, Loghain, Swan and Liani arrive to Salidar, where the dissident Aes Sedai are. Loghain is falling deeply into depression, but Min still can see the aura of future glory around him. Swan and Liani's situation puzzles the Aes Sedai there, but they resolve to keep Swan as leader of the spies. Swan then proposes to raise one of them as their own Amerland seat, so that they can declare that they are the White Tower in exile. But at that moment, Gareth Bryan, who was following Swan's group, arrives to Salidar. The Aes Sedai resolve to recruit him as a general to their army, which he agrees to after meeting some conditions. At the same time, Nynaeve and Elaine are traveling to the town of Samara, within the menagerie, whose owner, Valan Luca, flirts with Nynaeve whenever he can. Nynaeve enters Teleron Riyadh to meet Vergira, one of the heroes of the Horn dwelling there, who's helping the girls track Mogirian. But the hunters become prey as Mogirian sets a trap and captures Nynaeve. Vergira fights back and Mogirian flees, but only after striking Vergira, and, as a retaliation, sending her to the physical world somehow. This leaves her ill and Elaine proceeds to bond Vergira as her warder, which seemingly heals her. From now on, she has to disguise as another performer in the menagerie. All these things surprised me as I didn't think any of this was possible. I'm eager to see how this will play out. Could this be the wheel correcting itself so that Vergira is there for Tarmon Gaiden? Within the town of Samara, they meet the Shinarns that accompanied Rand to follow me and also Galad, again, who wants them to go to Camelin for safety. Nynaeve convinces him to find a boat, but makes no promises as to where they will go. So, along Elaine, they board the ship and sail to Salidar, the town where the dissident Aes Sedai are. There, they are received with a cold welcome and are treated as runaways. Swan and Liani, who are already there, are called to explain why they sent three accepted to chase thirteen Black Aja Aes Sedai. That is exactly what I said in my review of The Great Hunt. Thank you, Jordan, for acknowledging that was preposterous. Here at Salidar, Nynaeve and Swan reach an agreement. Nynaeve will teach Swan how to enter Teleir and Riyadh, and Swan will let Nynaeve study the still women, to learn if that can be healed. If that turns out to be possible, I'm guessing this can be the cause for Lagains for its all future glory. But let's give it time. Then, the time comes for Rand to battle Kuladin outside Kyrian. I won't dwell on the details, for I plan to talk about the battle elsewhere. But for now, let me just state that, in my opinion, it was too early for the numbers deployed here. The armies are too great for the epoch, and for the people alive at that time, with the nations diminished as they are. The fact that it was Matt who killed Kuladin was a nice move, but not showing it as a scene was a bad one. As a result of the battle, the dragon banner is now unfurled in Tyr and also Kyrian. I'll take the opportunity to mention the similarity between the dragon symbol on said banner with a Chinese dragon called Long, which traditionally symbolizes control over weather and rainfall. It also represents strength and power in Chinese culture, where outstanding people are compared to a dragon, to the extent that many dynasties viewed it as a prerogative of the emperor and even constituted the Chinese national emblem during the Qing dynasty. 
Its anthropomorphic representation is the Dragon King, the water and weather god, who is also a representation of the young masculine power, all of which contributes to the resemblance with the Dragon Reborn, the paragon of Sai Jin. Matt, after displaying his prowess in battle, has gained so much renown that he starts to get more men wanting to join him than he can handle. So he creates a group called the Band of the Red Hand. From now on I can see Matt earning his own merit. Rumors arrive about the death of Morghais, Queen of Andor, so Rand makes plans to attack Raven, the Forsaken now ruling in that kingdom. But before they can go, a few things happen. For starters, Melindra, Matt's lover, reveals herself as a dark friend and tries to kill him, but fails twice because of Matt's luck. I sincerely hope Matt won't get away with everything just because of his luck, otherwise this will feel cheaper and cheaper over time. But it is time to move on to the strongest part of this book, and of the whole series up until now, in my humble opinion. Moraine takes Rand to the docks of Kyrian, where she knows Lanfear is gonna show up. The daughter of the night is filled with anger because she found out Rand and Avienda were together. So she gives her last warning to Rand. He has to join her or die. Rand says he will never love one of the Forsaken, which infuriates Lanfear, and they start a battle. Rand has a chance to defeat her, but finds himself unable to kill a woman, even if it is one as evil as Lanfear. But luckily, Moraine has already foreseen all of this. She saw this whole situation when she stepped through the redstone doorframe in Rhydian, and knew Rand, incapable of killing a woman, will fail to defeat Lanfear, which would cause his death and, consequently, the impossibility of defeating the Dark One. So she has no choice but to shove herself against the Daughter of the Night, both falling through the doorframe, resulting in the death of the two women. At last, getting rid of one of the most dangerous of the Forsaken, but at the high cost of Moraine's life, Finally, it makes sense why she was so eager to teach Rand everything she knew in the shortest time possible, and her subservience to him in the last days. She knew, beforehand, that her time was limited. It's clear Lanfear didn't hear this advice. Do not underestimate the women in this tower. Following Moraine's demise, Rand sets off to Camelin to face Raven, accompanied by Matt, Avienda, Osmodian and many hundred Aeol warriors and maidens. But the Forsaken is prepared. When Rand arrives, Raven sets loose a horde of Trollocs to meet his Aeol, and also starts channeling heavy lightning bolts. Rand tries to stop them, but inevitably one gets through and kills Matt, Avienda, and even Asmodian, just like that. The death of his friends sets Rand into a rage, who races off to the palace, where Raven waits. Meanwhile, in Salidar, Nynaeve is teaching Swan to enter to Leiron Riad, but she sees a face looking at them, and worrying that it might be Mogilian lurking, sends Swan off. It turns out it was Mogilian that begins taunting Nynaeve, for she can sense that the girl is not able to channel. But Nynaeve succeeds in tricking the Forsaken, binding her with an atom she materializes, in a very clever move, using Mogilian's channeling against her. It was also pleasant to learn that Nynaeve can do what she has to, using an atom, even though she despises it, unlike Rand, who is unable to defeat Lanfear. Magirian, forced by Nynaeve, confesses that Rand is in danger, fighting Raven, so Nynaeve decides to go there to see if she can help somehow, even though she can only access through the world of dreams. She happens to be very lucky for Raven just decided to move his fight with Rand to Teleron Riyadh where he is getting the upper hand, until Nynaeve finds Ravi in a corridor, and channels fire all around him, as hot as she can make it. Raven burns until he shields himself, but those few seconds give Rand some respite to settle himself, channel all side in he can, and locate Ravin. She shoot at him a huge balefire beam. The Forsaken simply ceases to exist, and, as the balefire cast by Rand was immense, all actions done by Raven are erased, far back enough that the attack on Matt, Avienda and Asmodian never happened. This is exactly why I hated the tool of Bay of Fire as soon as it was introduced in the series. Even though this final showdown was one of the best so far, it was turned into rubbish by this. Sure, kill three main characters, it doesn't matter, we can just erase everything we don't like by using Bay of Fire. 
and have them back alive and kicking in the next chapter. I fiercely hope this is not going to be used again this way from now onwards, otherwise it's gonna become the biggest deus ex machina device ever in literature. The author could have come up with a better solution, as we would say in Argentina. Ponele voluntad la concha de tu madre, ponele voluntad. At least the book ends on a high note. Lord Bashir, Field Marshal of the Kingdom of Saldea, enters Camelin as it is being cleansed of the remainder of the Trollocs and pledges himself to Rand along 7,000 soldiers, allying himself to the Dragon Reborn. Rand declares an amnesty for all men able to channel and proclaims that they can come to him to be trained in the use of the One Power, for they will be needed in the last battle. This can lead the story to exciting moments. Just like that, with no warnings, Asmodian is killed by someone not revealed yet. I wonder who could it be. And last but not least, we see Morghese running away, trying to regain her place as Queen of Andor, still in search for supporters, but definitely alive, proving fools the rumors of her death spread by Raven. As always, thank you for watching, like and subscribe if you liked my content, and see you on the next one.